Hello and welcome to the Global Discussion, discussions with creative leaders and thinkers. Today I'm joined by Elena Ryan, Chief Executive Officer, and you're very welcome to the podcast today. And I want to, of course, begin by asking Elena to tell us a little bit about herself, her role, her organization, and to maybe share a little bit about her journey for our audience today. So Elena, over to you. Thank you so much. Um, so where to start? I'm the CEO of Children's Books Ireland, and I've been here for just over nine years. And when I started, I had been working for four years in a really small and brilliant publishing company called Little Island Books. And it was basically a two person operation. And I was so lucky uh, to be there under the mentorship of Siobhan Parkinson. And Siobhan was uh, our first children's laureate in Ireland. The, the role of Laureate Nanog went to her in 2010. And that happened while I was working with her. And I was actually working in her home in uh, an office that used to be her son's childhood bedroom and he and I are of an age so it was a really interesting working relationship but I learned an extraordinary amount from working with Siobhan over those few years and, and from setting up the company with her you know bringing on authors and doing everything in the company from strategizing to answering the phone to filing the VAT to doing the royalties to designing the catalogs it was a real um, all in do it all and when I came here to Children's Books Ireland there were three of us working full time and one part time project manager. And now there are six of us working full time and six part time staff. So it's grown quite a lot. Um, the thing that, that ties those two places together really is a love of reading. So Children's Books Ireland's vision is every child a reader. And Little Island's tagline now is, is something to the effect of great books for, for young minds and that all very much speaks to who I am and uh, what, what I love to do and what I love to focus on in my work. And I'm surrounded by an incredible team at Children's Books Ireland. We do an awful lot of different types of work that I'll tell you about in a little while. But the heart of everything is just to get children reading for fun from the very beginning of life through to their older teenage years and to give them all the benefits that come with that, including opening up the world to the imagination um, and it's a, a sort of an all encompassing role in the sense that the organization also supports authors and illustrators to do great work and supports the adults in children's lives to kind of share our enthusiasm and expertise with them where we can and make sure that they're able to guide the kids in their lives to find a book for them at the right time. Wow. Um, you started off, didn't you, I think, with your your educational background you did a BA in uh, language and cultural studies. And then from there, you kind of moved into the, the publishing, didn't you, at another university. Um, right. So was was that always the, the trajectory um, to get into publishing? Was that was that one of the sort of goals that you had? I started out doing my undergrad thinking I'd be a teacher, actually. Uh, okay. I studied English and French as part of that languages degree, languages and cultural studies. So I got a couple of years into the degree and decided that actually I didn't really want to deal with any of the disciplining that, I, that being in a classroom would bring. I really wanted to, uh, I guess, teach English to children who had no classroom behavior <laughs> issues. And that probably wasn't very realistic. So uh, I, ch I changed tack uh, after my four years undergrad I went off and traveled for a little while and worked as a hotel concierge in Canada and uh, came back and did a publishing master's, which was much more practical and prepares you for your first and second jobs. And, you know, it was training us in things like editorial markup and marketing and, and design uh, and a, a kind of a, a business minded view uh, from the University of Stirling, uh, MLIT and publishing of, of how to get into your your first job and get a foot in the door and it really prepared me very well I have to say for the role I took at Little Island Books uh, but I, I've I've taken a, a meandering trajectory of just following the things that I'm interested in when they come up at the right time which is probably the reason that I also work on a book festival outside of work um, and that's uh, something something that I do with my CPI hat off but very much in the same kind of world it's a, a festival called Towers and Tales down in Lismore in County Waterford the southeast of the country um, and I do that with Neve Sharkey, who was one of our other children's laureates. So very privileged to have the chance to program a book festival in a castle in a very nice part of the world. Yeah, that's a wonderful setting, isn't it? Um, so beautiful. And obviously following the educational uh, route into 
Little Island Books. I just want to unpack maybe for our international audience a little bit. The you are the managing editor there, I believe. That's so right. What did what what? I, obviously, it was a small organization, you know, and you were kind of you were saying doing everything from answering the phone to doing the VAT returns, etc. But what from a managing editor's perspective, what did you get involved in there? What did you like about that role? That's a great question. So. I had been taken on uh, actually as a, a publishing assistant between two companies, between New Island, which was a parent company, and Little Island, which was an imprint just for children's books. And actually, Little Island was a brand new part of that company. And when the recession hit, they had to part ways because the, the parent didn't have the funds to keep staff on. So in the end, it was like being hired into a new company, which crashed, and then we reset it up. Um, so it was a real learning curve because in that sense, we were literally filing the papers to begin a company. You were there from the absolute very beginning of trying to fundraise to make things happen. But the ethos of that company was to bring different voices into the Irish market. Um, Siobhan Parkinson's visit, vision there was to bring translations in to the Irish market, because as you'll know, I'm sure we don't get as much translation translation as some nations who don't have English as their first language. So um, because we have so much in Ireland from the UK, from the US, from Australia, from New Zealand, um, from Canada, there isn't necessarily a need for translation in terms of volume. But Siobhan really wanted to bring in incredible children's books, initially from Germany, and she would translate them herself, for herself from German to English. And then we brought in books from from Sweden and from Norway and from all over the place. And it was amazing to be able to do that, as well as nurturing new voices in Irish writing. So we had the honor of publishing writers like Sheena Wilkinson and Deirdre Sullivan, who went on to win the Children's Books Ireland Book of the Year awards as they were then the KPMG Children's Books Ireland Awards now, um, as well as many other accolades. And what I loved about it is working with the artists. So you get these writers who are trusting you with their work and you get to have an opinion on that and you get to help shape it and make it better and package it up and make it look beautiful and sell it, you know, to tell the world, look at this amazing book that I've heard about or that I've managed to read. And that was a really fascinating process and a really lovely process to be able to be the person who's there to kind of hold their hand as a new writer going out into the world. It's a real uh, privilege to be able to be in that position. Yeah, and it's interesting. I, I'm sure you're familiar with Literature Ireland and Sinead McKay and the team yeah. there. That are, they're doing good work in terms of translating, not necessarily in the, you know, purely in the area of children's books, mm. but they're doing some great work there in terms of that sort of promoting the Irish voice and the, the written word from Irish authors. And uh, But it's interesting as well to see the other way, bringing books into Ireland uh, from a translated uh, perspective. Yeah, it's about diversity of perspectives, I think. Yeah. And that's something at Children's Books Ireland we really focus on, that you have to look at who the voices are, who are getting published and what their perspective is. And if that is the dominant perspective, what our kids are absorbing when they read books so I think it's really important that we have you know always a place for debuts and uh, you know nurturing new Irish writing and new Irish illustration coming through as well yeah and when you started at uh, CBI Children's Books Island uh, did you go in as a director initially did you you know did you take on the role of chief executive officer or how did that work for you yeah, the title changed, but it's the same role. So the, the chief exec role was was known as director when I stepped in. And actually, when we stepped more into a fundraising role, um, there was a decision taken from the from a fundraising perspective and from the board, the chief executive might make more sense to our corporate partners because you get a lot of directors in uh, in the arts who are actually the chief executives. But yeah, it's been the same role all along. And when I came in, it was... Um, myself and and Jenny Murray and Aoife Murray and they're both still here uh, gladly nine years later and uh, uh, between us we've um, we've managed to really I guess change the structure of the organization and and make it bigger and better um, but yeah the the title may have changed and in a sense the role is the same but in another sense I've, it's been five or six different jobs you know there's been a real journey I guess in growing the organization and having a bigger team um, bigger team requires different structures, different supports, 
uh, a different <laughs> configuration of the space in here, you know, to get down to nuts and bolts. Um, but we, we've changed a lot in terms of how the organization has positioned itself as well. We're an arts organization. We're also a charity and we've done a lot of upskilling work in fundraising over the last four years, um, which has really helped us to achieve the ambitions that we've had uh, and in what we're able to do. Yeah, and it's obviously working because obviously you said, you, you know, from that small team, you've got a larger team now of people uh, working with you. And from a uh, funding perspective, the funding of the arts and the funding of particularly in terms of literature or children's books, um, it's quite challenging at the best of times. A lot of organisations that I'm familiar with, they really struggle with that area. So were there, were there any sort of key things that you had to do as an organization, as the chief executive leading the organization to really get yourselves into the position where funding could be delivered in a meaningful way to help you sustain and grow the organization? Yeah, we had to take a risk. Um, we, we didn't have the time between our existing team to invest in fundraising properly. And you really need time. You need somebody whose only responsibility it is to be the fundraiser and whose only thought when they're in work is how are we going to get the funds in and who do I need to follow up with and what pitch is live and what funding application is open right now. Um, so we approached somebody in 2018 to come and work for us on a contract basis two days a week. And it was a slow burner in terms of getting out there and building up relationships. But without that person whose remit it was to be the fundraiser, even starting from scratch with no relationships and, and not a lot of fundraising experience, we would never have done it because it was, you know, between a couple of us trying to find a sponsor for our awards and you're firing emails to corporate partners left, right and center, hoping someone will land. And you just can't do that. Fundraising is about relationships. It's about a person. Um, so between having a dedicated person to do that and having the support of the Arts Council through their RAISE program, RAISE was uh, conceived of as a capacity building program, especially for the arts, to build up capacity in fundraising skills. And uh, O'Kennedy Consulting, as they were then, now OKC, were appointed to deliver that program and they just have phenomenal expertise. So we've been working with them for the last four years and, and having one-to-one -one mentoring time with them that they'll give us a hand when we're stuck in a quandary, but also just guest speakers and, and lectures from themselves on, on the world of fundraising and how it works. And they always say people invest in people. So yes, absolutely. You have to have your governance in line. You have to have everything above board. We publish our accounts. We're you know, in line with the charities regulators governance code. But more than that, you have to have time to sit down and get to know people and to understand if it's a corporate partner or a major donor or whatever it is, what it is that they're looking for and to listen to them. So it's all about relationships, really. Yeah, that's great to hear in terms of those sort of real tangible building blocks that have to be in place to make that work. Because and it, like the, the minute the year closes, it, it all starts again, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> The, the the costs are constant yet the fundraising is an ongoing process so it's uh... yeah very much so and like we've been really lucky as well we've got some amazing corporate partners um including kpmg who sponsor our awards and on post to work with us through the year on things like world book day and our christmas book gifting and pride in the summertime so um we've been we've been very very lucky particularly with our book gifting work that a lot of people see the value in making sure that kids have a brilliant book in their hands when they might not otherwise have a culture of reading at home. And, and they've helped us to be able to do an awful lot of that. So coming to the end of 2022, um, we've given away 117,000 books this year. And that's unprecedented for us uh, in terms of that kind of volume. Um, so we're, we're really grateful that people get on board with our vision. Yeah, and the, the on the on past uh, work that they're doing, uh, particularly in the world of books, um, the profile seems to get bigger every year. So I'm sure that's helping the wider industry and, uh, you know, also promoting authors, uh, which is great. Yeah. And I wanted to ask you as well, though, about once you have the fundraising in place and obviously you've got your mission and, you, you know, you're, you're driving the importance of, of children's books. 
But how important are the other things that you're involved in? You mentioned festivals. I know that's slightly outside of CBI or your own awards program. How important are those sort of uh, additional elements that you do? Are they vital at this point or are they things you're still building on or how do they play a part in the overall strategy? Oh, absolutely. They're crucial. So we we have a lot of projects, um, a lot of different things that we do, but they all fall under the pill of our, pillars of our strategy. And the way we break that down really is three audiences. And one is children and young people. So, uh, you know, inspiring and enabling them to read. So the inspiring on the one hand is things like our book doctors who go out into the community as doctors, they have white coats, they have prescription pads and they say, hello, Simon, age five, you know, what is it that you like to read about? And you say, oh, I'm really interested in tractors. And they go, OK, cool. Here are 10 books about tractors and off you go on your way with your special prescription that's just for you. So sometimes it's very deeply one to one work inspiring kids to read. And sometimes the enabling is about advocacy. So we're actually speaking to government and saying you've got to invest in school libraries. It's structural inequality if you've got a child who has no books at home and no books at school and maybe isn't going to be brought to the local library, they just fall through the cracks. So children and young people are audience number one. Then you have your artists. So authors and illustrators, and I'm listing them second. It doesn't mean they're second priority. Very much into capacity building for them, whether they need help with you know, during the pandemic, folks had to do all their author visits or illustrator visits from home. They weren't visiting anywhere. They were just recording themselves. So we did a lot of upskilling in how to present a workshop from home in terms of the technical ins and outs, as well as the kind of creative side of it. Um, and we're really proud of a program we ran this year called Raising Voices, which is about getting folks from marginalized backgrounds into the children's literature sector and getting them ready for publication and, and that was a whole big suite of support so um recognizing the work of authors and illustrators who are out there working now as well as building up that pipeline is really crucial and then the adults so we spend a lot of time talking to who we broadly call the gatekeepers and those could be parents and carers grandparents teachers librarians booksellers and just shouting loud as we can about what's excellent so making sure that there's space in the media to cover children's books, making sure that they're on a par in terms of importance with adults books um, and making sure that we are connected with the publishers. So we're getting to see everything that comes out there. So it feels like a very broad array of activities, but we can see exactly where they fit strategically. And that's all underpinned by our values, which are excellence, connection and warmth. Um, and by a commitment to being inclusive and being sustainable in so much as we possibly, possibly can. I love warmth as a value. You don't hear that very often. In fact, I'm not sure I've ever heard warmth as a value. I think that's beautiful. It's really um, important uh, to us and it kind of in everything we do from the communications that you get from any member of our team to how somebody's going to answer the phone to how our publications look when you pick them up and the feeling that you get from it. It's something we've worked quite hard to, to cultivate. That's a big part of um It's very special because a lot of the values sometimes they're quite wordy, they're quite That's they're quite right. businessy. Yeah. And just one simple word, it just shows you the power of a word, doesn't it, when it comes yeah. to the value and what drives the way that you act and interact. Um, That's right. I love the prescription doctor. I think that's wonderful. <laughs> I was actually talking to a gentleman called Frank Prendergast recently. He's originally from Cork, where I was speaking to him in Kentucky. He runs uh, Frank and Marcy, uh, very big into sort of uh, marketing type activities and cut through and personal branding. And he was sharing with me five uh, books that he thinks every everybody should read if they're involved in that sort of area of the world. But I love the idea of somebody going around with a prescription pad and actually just saying, here's what you need to read. You know, I think that's wonderful. Uh, yeah, they're, they're amazing people. They have great recall as well as a huge knowledge. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And the raising voices that you mentioned, that certainly I, I felt as an observer from the outside looking in, that really got cut through, at least it, it sort of seemed to cut through a lot of the noise. And it seemed to really resonate with people that you were bringing these voices to the forefront. Yeah, we're so proud of it. It's the first time we've ever, ever run it. And like we we looked around us at programs in Ireland, like um pay forward that Skeen Press and the Stinging Fly were working on and we looked internationally at different kinds of fellowships and what the best bits of our, of those programs were that would work for our audience to really try to equip them 
with what they need. And we had also, as part of Words Ireland, been part of a big survey about barriers to access to the literature sector. And so many of those barriers you know, are things that you will have considered, like financial access to things that have pricey tickets. But some of them are so intangible, like a feeling that you're not ready to engage in courses, you know, a lack of knowledge about a particular course or just a feeling of being outside of a sector and not knowing how to get in. So the program that we built for our six fellows, our Raising Voices fellows, was really to include things like coming to our conference and for us to introduce them to people to literally say, this is Connor, this is Nene, or this is Jen, you know, there, there are six of them who are four writers and two illustrators, and their talent is extraordinary. But they've been introduced to a mentor, they've been given a critique by an art director or an editorial director in a publishing house. So already, they've seen a little bit of the publishing process, they have connections with people now in publishing houses, they're on social media, they're connected with us and we connect them with other members of the community who are writers and illustrators. And it breaks down a lot of the otherness of a community that you can kind of see from the outside, but not quite access. And that to us was just as important or more important than actually looking at their work and giving them a critique of it. No, absolutely. I think it's a wonderful uh, program uh, for sure. Um, I can't go any further without asking you about your favorite books. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so whether they're children's books or, or, or other types of genre uh, and categories of books, but when you read yourself, um, is, are you stuck into sort of papers and downloads and digital? Are you picking up a hardback book and breaking the spine on it? And what, what attracts you? What are the sort of books that you love to read or anything that you'd even recommend to our listeners? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, I am a, two kinds of reader. I I love a paper book. I have a Kindle somewhere, and I think I read it when I got married on my honeymoon. <laughs> so it's not in frequent use. Um, I I love a paper book, and I love an audio book. Um, and I, I'm not really an ebook kind of girl. So at the moment, I'm listening to Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow by Gabrielle Zevin, uh, which was recommended to me by a lot of writers, mostly YA writers. So actually, I thought it was a young adult book <laughs> for a start and uh, then quickly realized it wasn't. Uh, and I'm really enjoying that. But um, I'm also part of a book club and oftentimes book clubs are for folks who need new ideas and I have no shortage of ideas of things to read here because we're we're drowning in books but my book club is called book club of shame uh, for books that you really should have read but you haven't for whatever reason and that could be I've never read sci-fi I should really read Philip K Dick or this is a Pulitzer Prize winner or you know I've only ever read um, Catcher in the Rye by J.D. Salinger and, you know, not read anything else of his. So let's read Franny and Zoe. So I love that particular book club because it gives me great exposure to really interesting people, but also to books that I might not have come across. And, you know, the discussion with people who love to read around those books, it kind of doesn't matter whether you enjoyed them or not. Um, it, it's just about the fun of digging into something different to take me out of my uh, children's reading actually because I do so much reading of children's books for work um, and I love to read children's books I have to say I am a huge fan of picture books um, there's a lot of art on the walls of my home uh, of folks whose work I love including Sarah McIntyre and Shona Shirley MacDonald and Fatty Burke um, and, and lots and lots of other people so um, it's always very hard to pick favorites I've got uh, a big pile of books that came into my house at Christmas time, uh, including books by Lauren and Natalia O'Hara. Gorgeous, gorgeous book. Um, uh, also by L Lauren O'Hara um, called the, the Magic of the Ballet. Uh, I've got a stunning favorite book of bedtime stories illustrated by Sarah McIntyre that has a broad cast of diverse writers. I've got the new Chris Houghton coming into my house. Uh, well done, Mummy Penguin. We love Chris. Uh, he has such stunning, stunning work. And Chris Judge and Owen Colfer's book, uh, Cloud Babies. I'm a huge fan of Paddy Donnelly and lucky me, he does about six books a year. Uh, but Fox and Son Taylor's was one of the, my best of 2022 in illustration. Um, and Steve McCarthy is another stunning illustrator. I love, love, loved his book, The Wilderness. Um, I what I, I always knew I loved Steve's illustration. He had done three books of nursery rhymes with Sarah Webb, 
But what delighted us all was that he's a wonderful writer. He has such a way with words. They really are playful and gorgeous and make me smile. And the last book that I'll mention is Be Wild Little One by Olivia Hope, which has a very different feel. Uh, it's illustrated by Daniel Egnius and it has these kind of sweeping vistas of nature scenes. Um, so flocks of birds across the sky and a view from under the sea and a great big dandelion clock. It's these stunning, stunning um, nature scenes. And Olivia's writing is a real kind of instant classic. So uh, that was a, a big whistle stop <laughs> tour through some of the things that I'm reading at the moment. But uh, that's a dangerous question to ask a woman who works in books. <laughs> Listen, I had to ask. It's it's really important. <laughs> and uh, you've shared some really wonderful uh, wonderful books and authors and you mentioned some illustrators as well because often people don't discuss the illustration enough because it really tells the story in its own right doesn't it and there's some wonderful illustrators that you've mentioned there there are and I think the the best thing for children who are reading illustrated books is that the the best picture books are doing something different in the pictures to what the text is that telling them so you know a book like Meep which is written by Myra Zeff and illustrated by Paddy Donnelly it's an Irish language book about a robot who gets blasted off to Mars to take pictures of the aliens and of course there are no aliens as far as Meep is concerned but if you're reading this with a child they're going look it's behind a rock I can see it and the you know the text is saying oh Meep looked everywhere but there were no aliens and of course they're they're doing something different with the pictures and that's the wonder of a picture book is that it puts the child as its first reader and they can understand it even if the text isn't telling them what's going on it's brilliant and you mentioned audiobooks as well when you were speaking there and you know i've been a fan of audiobooks i love i love you know physical books um but i i'm also a big fan of audiobooks and i'm just interested in your view particularly within the the area of children's audio um how important the voice actor is or the voice oh, you know, yeah. the person actually reading the story and um are you involved in that area from children's books island or are, are authors coming to you and they're very keen to lead with audio now or is it still all about the written word in your world audio tends to stem from the written word so um, as a listener, I think it's crucial that you've got a good voice actor and sometimes writers will read their own work and be amazing at it. So Dave Rudden reads his own uh, Knights of the Borrowed Dark trilogy and he's wonderful. Dave comes from a, a primary teaching and drama background and, and has a great big booming voice when he needs to have one. And he's excellent. Uh, David O'Doherty, who's also a comedian reads The Summer I Robbed a Bank and it's a beautiful read. I love it. Um, my kids are listening to some of the Roald Dahl classics at the moment and they're read by people like Kate Winslet and Chris O'Dowd and that's a joy to listen to. Um, but you've got readers who aren't well-known personalities and who you get used to reading certain things. So there's a man called Patrick Moy who read some of Owen Colfer's Artemis Fowl books and went on to read Catherine Doyle's Stormkeeper trilogy and I love his voice. So uh, I, I would kind of listen to most things that he reads. It's really uh, influential when you find somebody you like. Sarah Crossan, who is one of our children's laureates, also read uh, her most recent book for adults, and it was beautiful. Um, but actually, the way it works in terms of selling rights is that the, the book tends to get published first. And more and more now, the bigger UK publishers are doing the audiobook release at the same time. But in the Irish publishing industry, and certainly in the Irish language publishing industry, often there isn't an audiobook available. And I love an audiobook when I'm out walking or driving or whatever it is. So I'd love to see more of it. But there are only a certain number of audiobook publishers as well. So it's it's not a very large market to sell rights to. I think it's another way in for kids. We do a lot of long journeys. So um, having a few bits to listen to in the car is a really nice way to avoid the fights <laughs> when you have small kids in the backseat. <laughs> Well, it's funny because I remember uh, my children are older now, but they, you know, b books on cassette was a thing back then. And th that was great for a car journey. Now, of course, it's all digital downloads. It's all ones yeah. and zeros. But I, it, it's interesting because I've often wrote to a publisher or an author and said, is there, a, is there an audio version in the works? And it, it's for some some types of books and for some uh, geographies um yeah. it's almost an afterthought I, I think whereas others are really leading in it and I think you mentioned some of the uh, great voice actors there and they really can bring the story to life even though it's from the written word you know and they're, they're yeah. reading it. 
And equally, if you don't like the voice, it can ruin it for you. Yeah, <laughs> so I right. won't be naming names there, but, you know, sometimes there's a particularly strong accent or somebody who is over egging the pudding slightly. And, you know, oftentimes that's when I'll switch it off and try and find a paper copy if the story is is still worth following. But it can grate on you, you know, and it can sometimes interfere uh, with your imagining of the character so uh, it's it's not quite as important as the story but it certainly has a, a heavy bearing on how you experience the story in your head 100 percent. and um the other thing i wanted to ask you then as you look over your career um in this uh world um are the people that you admire or are the people that have inspired you along the way whether it's been in the industry or outside of the industry just from a personal perspective I find that such a hard question because there are so many people that I admire in the arts and it's a really extraordinary position to be in that I get to meet them and work with them and know them as people. Um, so in, in this role, we uh, as Children's Books Ireland run our Laureate Nanogue programme on behalf of the Arts Council uh, and with support from the Arts Council of Northern Ireland and our Department of Children. Um, and that means that we get to work with folks like Owen Colfer and PJ Lynch. Um, I mentioned Siobhan Parkinson and Neve Sharkey, um, Sarah Crossan and Onyini Glynn, who's our current laureate. Astonishing, incredible artists whose work is just phenomenal. And getting to spend time with them and see the way they work and see the way they think behind the scenes has been a real honor and especially you know we work with so many children's authors and we run a conference every year and it's like two days of TED talks in a lovely cinema in Smithfield in the center of Dublin and through that we get to meet that kind of person internationally so illustrators like Mac Barnett and John Plasson and um, people like our own Mary Murphy who will be so generous with their information uh, that you get to see behind the curtain. We we once ran a, a conference on the theme of failure and we invited David Roberts, who's the creator of the Dirty Bertie books, among various, many, many other things, um, the, the Age of Twist series and all the other questionnaires. And he was so generous, uh, as was John Plass and as was David McIntosh, all illustrators, in, in showing us their terrible, terrible work <laughs> that never saw the light of day. So I admire all of those creative people around us all the time who have such genius in how they bring their ideas to the page and how they understand their audiences and the other cultural leaders who are around me as well. So people like Fiona Carney down in UCC in the Glucksman Gallery um, is such a clear, brilliant thinker. My own predecessor here, Mags Walsh, is a phenomenal person who's currently at the Arts Council working on um, the Creative Schools programme, was previously at the British Council. Um, there are any number of incredible people working in the arts and uh, I, I'd also mention my own immediate colleagues because I'm very very lucky to have an amazing team around me all of whom have their own um, different skill set and, and complementary skills so it's a very hard thing to pin down Simon <laughs> that's that's a bit of a fudgy well, answer I think, but it's I a think tough that's thing. A, great, a great answer because um, and it, it is uh, sometimes you, you reflect don't you and you go do you know what it I'm in a really nice position, you know, and it, sometimes you have to sort of stop and and just have a little think about it, isn't it? And to be able to interact with all the, that that wealth of talent and inspiration and passion and yeah. knowledge and expertise, and there, there seems to be an openness and a willingness to share in lots of lots of uh, areas. So it's wonderful to hear. Um, what as you look forward to the year ahead? um what are you most passionate about what are you looking forward to uh what's on the horizon for uh the children's books island this is a year of big thinking so uh our strategy stretches through to the end of 2023 so this year we've got uh quite a few of our team who only joined us in the last six or seven months we've got a few new board members who joined us at our last agm in september We'll be planning ahead to a new strategic plan. We'll be finalizing our quality, diversity and inclusion plan. And we'll be doing some work on sustainability and getting um, some, some solid practices and plans documented there as well. So that's really exciting because we've got 
so many projects that are kind of confirmed and 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 running and and everything is happening really nicely with them in the background but it's going to be a year for reflection and making sure that we've you know not just that we've got our ducks in a row but that we're thinking creatively about what it is that we want to do in the next few years and getting all that energy from folks who haven't been with us for all that long and harnessing that to make sure that everyone's voices and ideas are heard is going to be a really exciting time. That sounds good. Um, so look, I've asked you a lot there. We've, we've covered a lot of topics in a relatively short period of time, but I want to ask you before we finish today, is there anything else that you'd like to share with our worldwide audience? Is there anything you'd like to touch on that maybe we haven't covered today? I'd love to just, um, to send folks on to, to childrensbooksireland.ie for a little look. Um, there's an awful lot on there and I haven't gone into half of the detail of the things that we're working on, but if there is a child in your life, listener, whoever you might be, and you're thinking of getting them a present, I'd just say consider getting them a book and we can give so much guidance. We spend an awful lot of time um, trying to put together really good really clear guidance for folks who aren't sure where to start and you know some of the best advice that I've ever gotten is to do less and talk about it more <laughs> from one of our smart directors on our board um, and I think if we can be any help to anyone go check out the themed reading lists I think a book is kind of the answer to everything in our world so um, if there has been a celebration and you need a birthday present, go find a book for a kid who loves sport or a kid who loves graphic novels or a kid who loves reading historical fiction. Equally, if something tough has happened in their lives, go find a book that's about grief and loss or about first experiences or about feeling sad. Um, and I hope that we can be a bit of a resource to people and that we can point them in the right direction. Um, and now people will know where to find us. We're, we're everywhere on social media and I hope that we can be of some use to folks. That sounds sounds great, Elena. And uh, it's very interesting. It reminds me, I, I had a conversation recently with a gentleman called Angus Blair, who is um, he's out in Egypt at the moment, but he's been a, a high financier, a corporate financier for many years. He's involved now in a number of businesses in sustainability and ESG. And uh, I was asking him something along the same lines. And he was saying that everybody's glued to their smartphones. And he, he believes passionately that if people would read more, it would help with an awful lot of the conflict, the turmoil, uh, and the angst that's going on out there. So it's it's it's, it's interesting to see from your perspective um, how you know picking up a book can be an answer to a lot of situations in yeah. life. Can't it? You know, I think for parents, it's so tough to see your child struggling with something. And for yeah. me, you know, having my own kids now if there's anything going on, whether it's starting school, feeling lonely, something's gone on with a friend, there's a loss in the family. It, I know where to go because we have all these guides and, you know, all these books in our house as well, but not everybody has all that information at their fingertips. So you just want to be as helpful as possible because books are a brilliant way to take perspective. Like you, you want to be able to see yourself in a book, particularly, you know, for kids of color or kids with a disability who haven't always been represented in books, publishing is getting better. And we want to celebrate the books that are doing a good job of that. And then for kids whose experience that isn't, to give them a view into that without putting the burden of education on somebody in the real world is a really lovely, lovely thing. So yeah, more books, more empathy. Eh? <laughs> I think that's a wonderful note to finish on. So people can find more at childrensbooksisland.ie. Correct. Listen, that brings us lovely to the end of today's episode. Uh, it's been a pleasure to be here on the Global Discussion with Elena Ryan, the Chief Executive Officer at Children's Books Ireland. Thank you to everybody who's watching and listening. And we'd ask you to like or subscribe or share the podcast and hopefully join us again for more discussions with creative leaders and thinkers. Thank you very much indeed, Elena. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. 